And we are back with uh, our guest for today, who is uh, Teresa Njoroge. She is an ex-prisoner, but I don't want to identify her with that because she has uh, um, reintegrated her life back and she's doing amazing things to women who were previously jailed or women who are just about to be released through her organization called Clean Start. Now, tell me, um, you know, we were having this conversation about children yeah. and uh, the life, uh, how life happened. Yeah. 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 Overnight. <laughs> and things just yeah. switched up for you. Yeah. You know, when you were growing up, you know, most people, they yeah. never imagined. Yeah. Personally, I've never imagined that I can go behind bars. Yeah. So let's just take a pause on that for now. Mm. Where did you grow up? Yeah. What was your dreams like? Mm. Where did you, what was your dream career? Mm. I'm sure you must have a you must have had a big dream yeah, for your life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no one grows up thinking I'll end up in prison. You know, if you talk to any young child or you know what, what are your aspirations, no one ever imagined that they would even end up uh, with anything to do with the within the criminal justice system. And just like you, I never ever imagined. You know those things you never even imagine. I got to know about the prison uh, courts, yeah. the police, yeah. and all that the day I got arrested. Prior to that, I had never even rubbed shoulders with a policeman. So you can imagine the shock and the trauma of being picked <laughs> from work and taken into that system. And you're in so much shock and disbelief. And you know, when you're in the corporate world or in school or wherever, you think those who break the law are the ones yeah. who end up there. Mm. So your perspective, even you can't believe that you're there. But prior to that, I loved life. Uh, <laughs> you know, thank God so much for everything. I believed in uh, integrity, mm. authenticity, empathy, uh, hard work. And, and doing what is right. Uh, I grew up in Nanyuki. Uh, that's where my dad worked and, you know, uh, a beautiful family, my mom and uh, uh, four siblings. Uh, as, as a firstborn, uh, very close with my parents and my siblings and you, there's that role of uh, direction, which mm. way things should go and yeah. responsibilities mm. early on, you know. Mm. Uh, uh, you just feel, I just need to do things right. Yeah. Not just for me, but my siblings as well. They were watching. You know, so, so you feel there's a, um, I need to play that role uh, of, of, of the kind of behavior yeah. and hard work that we should exhibit. My parents were staunch Christians um, and they would do, just like any other family, doing what's right and bringing up their children well educating them well and making sure they have all their needs and it was amazing it, it really was nice um, my desire and ambition to join the financial sector was also a family project because my dad was a banker and here i was saying to the family i'll be a banker just like dad mm. so they were very happy when i achieved that milestone mm. uh, my teachers were very supportive I remember my high school teacher is the one who enabled me to get a scholarship uh, to go and study and have my degree. And I, you know, I was like, I'm going to study in banking and finance. Mm. So my teachers also played a very huge role into me ending up within the financial sector. And it was amazing. It's something I loved and you've got all manner of dreams. Uh, of course, you think about CSR and yeah. projects you would um, contribute towards, at that time I really wanted to contribute towards um, the health sector. Mm. There was something that drew me to that. Uh, as much as I was in the financial sector, that was my CSR. Mm. Uh, I'd go to Kenyatta National Hospital and interact with doctors, patients, and that was my, my, my contribution other than the work that I did. And it was incredible, it was amazing. Um, and then, boom. You, I didn't see it coming. <laughs> I didn't see it 
coming. I rested. And then you think, because this is the judiciary, definitely we will get to learn that this is wrong. Yeah. And we kept moving from one step to the next. And the arresting officer kept saying to me, if you don't give me my bride, and I'm thinking, but you have such audacity. Like, you can do this. Knowing too well I'm innocent. And, and he would yeah. say to me, you don't need to keep explaining. I know. You don't need to keep crying and explaining and being emotional. This is a transaction. So, I'm trying to reconcile. I have done what is right. I have not done anything wrong. But you are doing what is wrong. And you want me to pay you, which is wrong, so that it is right, yet it is wrong. It just didn't add up. I, 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 it was so difficult. So you can imagine when I was in prison now, sitting in prison and wondering, am I sure I'm in the right country? Am I sure? Am I really sure of anything? Mm. Because you're wondering, how can you do what is right and end up being punished for it? So, a lot now starts playing out. No wonder people steal and they walk free. And so this is what it really means. So it, it now starts making sense to you. And then, you know, at that time we would range between 700 to 1,000 women at Langata Women Maximum Prison. And you would hear stories of women and they would say to you, you know, for me, uh, I was in the house, my husband had firearms. I didn't even know. When they came looking for him, they couldn't find him. So they picked me, poor woman. You know, you would hear all these kind of things. Uh, I was trying to, that day, you know, because a lot of the women are victims of gender sexual based violence. Yes, yeah. And most of them. And they would say to you, I had been violated and abused and so on this particular day, I was protecting myself and the man, man fell and here I am. So you're in there, victims, innocent ones, and then some of the criminals, all mixed up together. And the criminals would be laughing at you and, and, and saying to you, so now your innocence has brought you here. Yeah. At least you would have committed a crime like me and then we would be sitting here together. Look at you. And you know, they would talk and, and say, now when you go out there, go and commit a proper crime. So that at least when they bring you here, they bring you right. But that's wrong, you know. So, um, we don't treat the poor, the vulnerable in the right way. And it's time, especially during this COVID-19 wake up call it's time for us to rethink very many things. You know, the world keeps give, giving you nudges. Yeah. It keeps giving you nudges. And then when you don't respond, it reacts. So I, I feel like this is a nudge for us to reset, for us to rethink and say, can we have a new beginning? And, you know, get our moral conscience right because the direction we are headed it, it's not the right direction. many people are in prison yet they are not offenders yes. mm. and prisons are for rehabilitation, for rehabilitation of offenders so what am i doing in prison i'm not an offender so what are you doing with me in prison is that what inspired you while you were serving your term in prison is that what inspired you to start thinking of coming up with a solution or was there, was there, what was the turning point? The turning point was after I got released. While I was in prison, I can never turn my back mm -hmm. to the cry, the genuine cry of the women in prison. prison. Mm -hmm. Genuine cry. You know, someone crying saying, if only I get an opportunity not to get out of here, no food, no house, no bus fare, no nothing. I don't even know where my children are. If I can get a decent opportunity to never ever come back here. And you know, some women would leave three months, they're back. Oh my God. Oh, I was arrested this time round. I don't know what I was. Do you know, even as they're leaving that gate with no bus fare, with nothing, yeah. she's thinking, what can I hope today? Mm -hmm. 
Where will I go? How do I even get to town? How, how, how do I even begin? We have no halfway houses. Yeah. We have no plan. Post prison, there is no plan. Yeah. You are on your own. And I would wonder, these women must be crazy. How do you leave this place and come back? Because I couldn't wait for my exit date. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you when I, so, so when I was in prison, I would think to myself, when I leave, I will see what to do for the women here in prison because it was very clear but no one prepared me for the life post prison mm. i thought imprisonment was hard right, yeah. until i got released mm. the stigma it's like you have this tag on your forehead saying ex-con first and foremost to get a certificate of good conduct and everywhere you go to ask for a job certificate of good conduct mm. You have no money. It's not like you've been working. Yeah. You, you used all your money for legal representation. It all went to the drain. You, in prison, it's not like you're earning money. So it's not like you're living with some cash. Yeah. You have nothing. You come out of prison as a dependent. So you're a dependent. Your child is a dependent. Someone has to give you food, accommodation. You know, the basic yeah. needs in life, someone has to support you with that. And it's not like tomorrow there's some work waiting for you. It's not like you have some capital stashed somewhere. Do you know it was so difficult? One of the women who I served time with, she, she was serving a five-year sentence. She did not complete a year on the outside. She scorched herself and her son. She didn't complete a year. That tells you what the outside world is. Stigmatization. Ule muizi, amerudi kutoka jela. Ule msherati ule. Ile, ile habusu. Dignity is taken away from you. Every, people don't deem you like a person, like a human being in need of a second chance. That stigma hit me so hard. And then seeing how my fellow colleagues yeah. with whom we served time with yeah. were being treated. Because I had parents and a family to support yeah. me. Yeah. They had no one. They would be in Eatururu Park or where. And I'd hear their stories. Children dying of pneumonia out in the cold because they had nowhere to go. And I said to myself, enough is enough. Even if I don't have any capital, even if I don't have, I said, I will not even wait. I'm starting to do something now. So at that time I had nothing. So all I did was, I said, I want other people to empathize. To understand the issues of imprisonment and the challenges of reintegration and I said that's all I will start sharing my story sharing the stories of these women for people to hear that we need support that we need a holding hand we need opportunities to rebuild our lives and at that time I called the outfit support me in my shoes that's where I started in other words just trying to tell you try and walk in my shoes before you judge me, try and understand me. And I'd go to faith-based organizations and speak there because they would be more empathetic and we would get some support, some food, some, you know, to, to keep going I'd up to the point where I legally registered Clean Start. And oh my goodness, we are a team of 17 women. Half of those women, I met them at Langata Women Maximum Prison. Wow. Some are coaches. Wow. Some work to ensure that the women businesses are running okay. Some are fundraising. Others are looking for partnerships. You know, so it's a combination of experts who have come from different fields, media, communications, advocacy, and we've all come together and say we have to do something. We're, we're building a robust organization yeah. that's got good governance. Uh, we work in five counties in depth but our services reach all women prisons in the country and um, we have what we call the coalition of formerly imprisoned women. So any woman who comes out of prison mm -hmm. joins this coalition. You don't have to go through what we went through. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is we're trying to create a parallel system. 
uh, a parallel cycle. Instead of going through the poverty, yeah. petty survival crimes, Crime, imprisonment, coming back to prison, uh -huh, yeah. mm. we, we You're create breaking another it. cycle. Mm. You get into a circle of healing in prison. When you leave, we pick you, we take you into a circle of healing. On the outside, you meet your other sisters. Mm. Then we put you in what we call a table of support. That's where we inject capital to, for you to start an income generating activity. And that's the sisterhood. We have more than 500 women now. Wow. How many women have uh, benefited or yeah. have you impacted their lives? Yeah. There are many. Many. There are many. And we have circles. We have circles in Machakos, mm -hmm. Nyeri, uh, Thika, Muranga. Uh, very soon we are planning to go to Busia. We have some of our sisters in uh, Nanyuki, Isiolo who have come out of prison and are part of this uh, coalition, rebuilding their lives. Uh, um, media and end of year, all the women come together. So if COVID-19 comes down, yeah. we'll have it uh, physically. If not, uh, then of course we have it virtually. The problem is that most of them are not connected virtually, but that's something we're really working hard yeah. to make sure happens because it also saves on other costs. Uh, but it's incredible. The journey has been very difficult, very, very painful and traumatic, and we're still rebuilding it. But it is incredible to see the lives of the women transform, turn around. Wow. To have some of them even become coaches and go back into these prisons as coaches and, you know, so paying it forward. Mm. Yeah. Paying it forward. Mm. My life is turned around, I pay it forward to, to another sister, and so on and so forth. It's incredible. Do you think you would have thought about prison reform advocacy? <laughs> I think you share a vision with, uh, what's her name, this celebrity she's called, Kim Kardashian. I know she's also very passionate about prison, <laughs> prison reform reforms, reform. yes. Yeah. Would you have, was, was it somewhere in your mind? Was it something you had thought oh about? Oh my goodness me. I remember <laughs> when I was a young little yeah. girl yeah. and my mom had taken me to hospital. And I remember she was, getting for me the medicine from the pharmacy and, and I was sitting waiting for her yeah and I saw because the uniform was still the same uniform yeah. I wore <laughs> the kunguru yeah. I, I saw them at the hospital that day you've missed school you've been taken to hospital by your mom and I jumped to my mom at the hospital because I was like oh my gosh criminals <laughs> and you know they were uh, handcuffed yeah. And we were the only ones at the waiting lobby at the pharmacy. And my mom, you know, just cooled me down and said nothing bad will happen. You know, the wardens are there. And I looked at them, like, don't even come near me. Funny, funny, funny. That picture has stayed with me. Because when I wore that coat. Oh my God. I remembered when I was a oh young little God, girl yeah. and so those and I, I, I thought to myself how many of us see these women these men in that kunguru and think to ourselves oh my I don't even Criminals. want them to come anywhere near me mm. who would have thought in a million years that I would oh end up in God. their very shoes in prison with my daughter you never know about tomorrow. You just never know. Let's be more empathetic. Before you judge someone, understand their situation and see what you can do about it. The highest level of empathy is not just feeling. It's also doing something once you get to know, once you have heard that this is happening. Don't just listen to Queen and Teresa having a conversation. Mm -hmm decide to add your voice to change the current narrative of those being in prison. Yeah. You know, Teresa, having this conversation, uh, I know many people are watching and distancing themselves. You know, the way we do, like, no, that one is not for me. Okay? Because I believe uh, our life's purpose, it comes to us in different forms. We never know when it hits, it just comes. Yeah. Um, 
do you think this was somehow aligned to your yeah. purpose? Are you angry? Are you angry at God? Are you angry at yourself? Have you accepted that this was supposed to happen in my life? Yeah. As you say, purpose hits you when you don't even realize. As you're going around your businesses, and sometimes when we cut short the process, we miss the opportunity. Okay. If I had paid that arresting officer, that bribe, I would never have lived to know or serve in my purpose. So sometimes we cut short because of not wanting to go through the process. So I mean, you know, initially I was very hurt. Initially when I was in prison and when I was really suffering when I got out, I was very hurt and pained. But the minute the eyes got off me genuinely and got to the others, I got my healing, I got my purpose, I got my reconciliation and forgave what happened. It was a path to something transformational. And Judas, each and every one of us, wherever you are, you have your Judas. And look at what Jesus did to Judas. Yeah. And Jesus was Jesus. He knew this is my Judas. Sometimes we don't know who is our Judas because they, they, they are their friends amongst us. Yeah. Yet this is your Judas. Yeah. But let me tell you, it is the Judas who propels you to your destiny. Okay. So don't get so hard. Yeah. So, you know, the people at the bank, the arresting officer and prosecution and the magistrates, whoever, however they colluded and did whatever they did for me to end up in prison. That was my Judas moment. They betrayed me, but it ended up turning around to be destiny, purpose, brought so many possibilities. Of course, they still work yeah. as far as healing is concerned, yeah. but I thank God. He continues to restore. He continues to give joy and glad gladness for the ashes. You know, talk of transformational, you have even given a TED talk. Not because of your banking job. <laughs> Not at all. You spoke to, you said five, over 5,000 people. There were 5,000 people in the auditorium. And many are still watching. Yeah. But it was a beautiful speech you gave. Thank you. How was that for you? It was, you know, looking back, yes. it was beautiful. But I tell you, the, the stress to me. <laughs> you look so composed. The nervousness. You're looking very beautiful. You know? <laughs> it was, oh my goodness me, good things don't come easy. Uh, and we should learn to embrace the toughness of the journey. Because I can sit today, uh, a couple of years later, and look at the TED Talk and be wowed by it and be grateful for that yeah. opportunity. And I'm very, very grateful. Yeah. For that opportunity to give that talk at TED Women. Uh, but the journey, you know, because um, you don't have any notes, you don't have any prompter, you've got to just be before these 5,000 people and in 10, 12, maximum 15 minutes, give this story in a nutshell, the, the pressure, the stage and, and all that. But grateful. Yeah, we are. Somebody yeah. said something about beautiful destinations and difficult roads. Difficult roads often lead to beautiful, beautiful destinations. destinations. I think we're going to end <laughs> on that note. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to this episode of Her Standards. We are talking about a woman you should know. And you should know her because of the initiatives she's doing to help women who have been imprisoned recover their lives and do the stigma that the society has uh, bestowed upon them. And of course, she says, work is still moving, work is still work in progress, and there's still a lot more that needs to be done. As we wind up, I believe there are people who probably are just wondering how they can partner with my guest for today. If there are initiatives they want to do together, I'm going to ask her to stare at the camera and tell us how we can reach you, especially on social media. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that we, we can follow up with you on the activities that you are doing. So just mm. uh, once again face the camera. Yeah, mm. thank you. Thank you so much for having us from Clean Start. Uh, to reach us, we are at Clean Start Kenya on all our social media. So Facebook, Clean Start Kenya, uh, Instagram at Clean Start Kenya, 
Twitter at Cleanfat Kenya uh, and LinkedIn as well. And you can visit our website, cleanstartkenya.org and you will get all information on how we can join hands together and transform the lives of women, girls and their children in prison and post-imprisonment. Thank you. Well, thank you, Teresia. I keep calling you Teresia. It's Teresa. <laughs> the national ID is actually Teresia. It's Teresia, so I'm <laughs> so actually I'm right. right. Okay, <laughs> thank you for your time. Mm. Um, difficult conversation, but I love how you, you do it so, you know, selflessly and seamlessly because you believe in it. So thank you so much. We wish you all the best in your endeavor. We hope that the society can partner with you to help women, ex-inmates, reintegrate their lives and just lead normal lives. Thank you. Uh, this conversation is not over. We are gonna carry on on social media, so talk to us. We are available across all platforms at KTN Home, and you can also hit me up directly at Queen Imbori, Facebook, Instagram, uh, Queen Isaina on Twitter, and Queen Tambori on LinkedIn. This is Her Standards the show that sets the, t the tone for gender equality and women empowerment conversations. Till next time, stay safe and please don't let your guard down. Bye for now. Woman of the Week is Phyllis Mwandi. Phyllis is the highly talked about mother who donated breast milk to Angel Center for Abandoned Children's Home in Waidaka, Dagoreti South. When Phyllis Mwandi, a mother of two, delivered her second baby five months ago, she immediately started expressing breast milk to ensure the little one survived exclusively on the liquid gold for six months as recommended. While her baby is now almost transitioning to solids, Mwandi realized she has extra bags of frozen breast milk that her baby might never need. Mwandi had been expressing the breast milk daily and ensured she stored at least 400 milliliter. Had she wanted to donate at a health facility, she would have been denied the opportunity. And this is because Kenya has only one human milk bank which is located at Pumwani Maternity Hospital in Nairobi and only mothers who deliver at the facility are allowed to donate breast milk to the bank. When Phyllis realized she had extra milk, she called Angel Center for Abandoned Children. The director of the home accepted the donation on condition that she gets tested for infections such as HIV and Hepatitis B. After receiving the green light from her doctor, she delivered 8 liters of the breast milk to the center. The importance of breast milk cannot be overstated. Babies who are exclusively breastfed tend to fight off infections much more effectively. Children who need donated milk often cannot access their own mother's milk because the mother is deceased or the baby was abandoned or the mother is too sick to the point of not being able to breastfeed. For this noble act, this week we celebrate you Phyllis Mwandi.